So we've been in a series talking about Jesus, friend of sinners, and the fact that people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and Jesus liked them too. And um, I was thinking about it when we were talking about um, the lost that, have you ever lost something that was of value to you? Like um, maybe like your keys or your wallet or your cell phone, or let's just face it, sometimes the things that we value aren't necessarily valuable. I mean, keys are metal, but it's what they do for me that's important. Um, the remote control, you can get those a dime a dozen, but when you're missing one, it's important. Amen? I lost my keys a few years back, um, which is it's surprising because my, my wife misplaces her keys far more than I do, but I legit just lost them, like never recovered them. Um, it wasn't like, a, oh, I think I left them here. It was like, I think they must have thrown them away. Like I have no idea what happened to those things. Here's the thing that, that's interesting when you lose something. It's all you can think about. The moment that you lose something, the moment that you all of a sudden realize that you've lost something, because a lot of times you've lost something far before the time that you actually like realize it, it becomes an obsession. And uh, you, all, it's the only thing you can think about. It's the one thing that you've lost. And when my wife misplaces things, I'll be like, it's going to turn up. Just chill out. It's fine. But when I lose something... <laughs> Everybody in the house better drop every stupid thing that they're doing right there and help me and, and actually like get off of their device, get, do, just do something, just look alive right now because I have lost something and we need to figure out until it's been found, I need your help to find it. And so we do crazy stuff. We start yelling incoherently at our family members, like maybe just me. Um, and, I, like, and I'm not sure why, but, and maybe you can relate to me in this, that like, I feel like every time I lose something, I usually begin by demanding that every lazy member of my family get up off the couch because I'm sure, I have this idea that I'm sure they're sitting on the thing that I'm looking for. Do you ever be there? You're just like, I know it. I've looked around. I've looked everywhere, which means like 20 seconds. And I'm like, I know it's under your butt, right? Get up. And we start flipping couch cushions. We're just looking for this thing, and I'm sure. And then we start, if that doesn't work, then we start, like, accusing our family members of conspiracies, right? Like, I know you moved. You moved my keys. I know, I know you. Oh, they're in my pocket, right? Like, I mean, we become obsessive about this thing. As soon as we realize that we've lost something, it's the only thing that we can, we can think about. And just like you and just like me, God seems absolutely obsessed with lost things. In fact, Jesus says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, right after he does the whole Zacchaeus come down, I want to go to dinner with you. He says this in verse 10, he says, the reason that I came is to seek and to save the lost. In fact, if you watch the life of Jesus and you go through the different gospels, it seems like the more lost people were, the more he seemed to seek you out. And the people that didn't consider themselves lost or considered themselves already found, he really didn't pay that much attention to. And that was an issue for the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They had questions about this. Why in the world does he not pay attention to me? Why in the world does he hang out with on-purpose sinners and bad guys? Why in the world does he want to go eat dinner with tax collectors and sinners? And if we're honest, really honest, it's an issue for us today as well. Those of us who are in the church. And so we're going to read, um, it's actually a series of three parables that Jesus tells, but he tells it in response to the question, why in the world are you hanging out with on-purpose bad people? We read it in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So this motley crew of people were gathering around and listening to Jesus. Verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. That's a good word. Muttered. They said, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And it's this muttering that is the setting for Jesus to tell the next three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. 
And each one of these parables, and we're going to go through them quickly, each one of these three parables gets more and more disturbing. I know you maybe you've read them before and you're like, oh, I like that one about the last sheep. I like the one. They get more and more preposterous, more and more weird, more and more unbelievable. So let's start it out. It says in verse 3, Jesus hears them muttering, and it says, then Jesus told them this parable, the first one, number one. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and then go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And I just love how Jesus makes this assumption because for me, I know I'm not a shepherd and I don't think any of you are, but that seems weird to me that the assumption would be, yeah, you got you got 100 sheep, one of them wanders off because he's dumb, and you just leave the 99 to just fend for themselves. You'd be like, hey, you can just kind of chill, do your thing, sheep, eh. and then you, you go looking for the one lost, wandering, dumb sheep. Like, for me, that, that's not normal. That doesn't seem like something that, 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 I, that I would do. But Jesus is like, well, of course you would do that. And then he says in verse 5, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and then goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors. He gets everybody. He gets, calls them a big block party together. And he says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. To which most of them are like, didn't know you, lose, you lost one. I had, I had no clue, right? So this is already sounding a little bit obsessive actually a lot obsessive, a little irrational. I mean, who throws a party for one dumb sheep unless you're eating him, right? (laughs) Which would kill two birds with one stone. I'd be like, you know what? We're having a party. Mutton's on the menu, right? I mean, I don't, I'm no, I'm sorry for those of you in PETA. I'll say you could, you could feed two birds with one scone. That's what they say in PETA. That's what you should say. So I'm sorry if you're offended. I'm not sorry. I like meat. I like meat and I'm not ashamed. Um, so then Jesus applies his obsession to lost people in this same thing. He says, verse seven, I tell you in that in the same way, there will be rejoicing, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who righteous persons who do not need to repent. And so Jesus is already dividing the room a bit. We already said in verse 1 and 2 that like it was the sinners and the tax collectors that were hanging out, gathering around, listening to Jesus, and then the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are there and they're muttering and like, I don't know why he's talking to them. Why is he not looking at me? He should be looking at me. But Jesus is hanging out with all these people, on purpose sinners. So it's already getting weird. And then he continues. Or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins um, loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? I mean, essentially, she's saying, like, doesn't she tell all of her lazy kids to get up off the couch and start flipping couch cushions and say, everyone needs to help me find my lost coin? You took my coin. I I mean, like, doesn't, isn't, isn't that normal? Okay, this one, all right, maybe a little more normal. But here's what's not normal. Financially speaking, these two parties are not Dave Ramsey approved. Both of these parties, the the cost of the party far outweighs what was lost. It was one dumb sheep. You got 99. That's a pretty good percentage, dude. Instead, you gather a block party and throw a huge party because of one dumb sheep. You lost one coin, you found it. Then you call a huge party. Everyone rejoice with me. We're going to have a weekend party here because of one lost, lost coin. Like My point is this, that God's response to finding lost things is simply out of proportion. It, 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 it doesn't even make sense. But I think what Jesus is communicating, what he's setting the stage for, is that for God, lostness doesn't mean that something loses value. In fact, for God, lostness means that something is of greater value. And then Jesus gets to the third parable. He's just like, boom, boom, boom. And this third parable is known as the parable of the prodigal son. You've probably heard it many times before, kind of like the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son is a pretty well-known parable. And it's like Jesus is building up to this last parable. It's like you got the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then we get to the lost son. Why would I say that he's building up to it? Because this parable, the third parable, isn't about a dumb sheep 
that wandered off. And it's not about a coin that was mistakenly misplaced. This is about a person that was an on-purpose sinner, chose to get lost. That changes everything. He goes on in verse 11, starts out. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Essentially, this is awkward in any culture. <laughs> so you're like, well, I don't understand what that's. It's, it's just as awkward in our culture as it would have been in their culture. Essentially, this son is saying to his father, hey, dad, I know you're not dead yet, but can we act like you are? Can I get what's coming to me when you die right now? Awkward, mean, insensitive, rude, unloving. Look at what the father does. It says, so he divided his property between them. Keep that up there for a second. I never noticed this before, but isn't it interesting, that last word? It says, so he divided his property between them. It's interesting that he divided his property between them, which means that the older son got his inheritance that day. In fact, he got more. The older son got two-thirds. That was Jewish law. So as the father divided up his inheritance between them, the older son got two-thirds of the inheritance. The younger got one-third. Keep that in mind as we continue in this parable. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He went to Vegas, Sin City, dropped it all on the craps table. Like he went all out and had nothing to show for it, okay? Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs which is literally the bottom of the barrel for jobs of a good kosher Jewish boy. Going to feed pigs is not anything that anybody would be signing up to do. You stay away from pigs, okay? Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So in other words, he was longing for the world to give him what only his father could provide. Isn't that interesting? And it's the same thing that we're all tempted to do, aren't we? We're all tempted to look to the world to provide for us something that really our Heavenly Father can be the only one to provide. So we look to the world to provide us financial security. We look to the world to provide us our identity, like tell me who I am, which is really the job of our Heavenly Father. And so we, we, we scurry around and, we, and we, we scroll and we click and we like and we comment and we subscribe and we unsubscribe and we heart and we post and we filter and we wait hungry. Are they going to like me back? Are they going to heart my picture? <laughs> Waiting for the world to give us what only our Heavenly Father can provide. We're waiting and looking for acceptance. We're waiting and looking for security. We're waiting and looking for something that really our Heavenly Father should be providing us. And we seek and we look for all these other things in our world to provide what really our, God, our Heavenly Father should be. And he goes on in verse 17. We, he came to his senses. It says, when he finally came to his senses, like, what in the heck am I doing? Like, I'm really hoping that, that the world's going to give me this? And no. It says, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And he comes up with a three-part plan. He's like, okay, I got this. I, I this is going to be my plan to get back into my father's house and at least I won't be starving. In verse 18, he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, number one, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Number two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And number three, make me like one of your hired servants. So he gets up and he goes to his father and he's probably thinking it as he's going, he's like, okay, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you just please make me one of your hired servants? 
he's got this thing and he's going. He's thinking, all right, I'm going to go back home. I don't know what dad's going to be like, but I'm going to get going. I'm going to get going. And what happens at the rest, to the rest of this parable that I'm about to read to you is absolutely preposterous. In fact, it's unbelievable. It doesn't even make sense. There's never been a father that looks like this father. It, 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 don't forget, this is a made-up story. This is not a real story. These are made-up characters. This is a parable that Jesus is speaking, but it is so unbelievable, but it's so preposterous, so over the top that it doesn't even make sense. And he goes up, and <laughs> essentially what Jesus is doing is he's redefining the father heart of God. He's redefining to a group of people, a bunch of sinners and a bunch of Pharisees and teaches the law, he's redefining what the father's heart truly looks like to a group of people who have fathers that just like you and I, that aren't always perfect, just like you and I. And he's like, I want you to understand again what the father's heart looks like. And he, and he en encapsulates it in this preposterous dad. Verse 20, it says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He saw him. It's almost like he was waiting. It's almost like he was watching. I picture like this dad kind of on his rocking chair, just waiting, looking on his front porch on the horizon, waiting for his son. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day he's going to come home, praying for him, waiting for him, longing for him to return back to home. He says he saw him. And in, in, in your notes, it says this, that God seeks you and sees you even while you're still a long way off. I want you to know that. Even if you feel like you're a long way off, you're like, Pastor, I, you don't even know what I've done. You have no idea the things that I've seen. Like the, even if you feel like you're a long way from home, your heavenly father sees you and he seeks you. Yes. Thank you and what does the father see? Does he see his failed messed up, emaciated, washed up, broke as a joke, look what the cat dragged in, son? No. Maybe that's what the world saw in this kid. Maybe that's what this kid saw in himself, but this father sees his son. He sees what probably the son couldn't even see in himself. And I want, I want you to know that this father, that your heavenly father sees what you probably don't see in yourself. He sees you. He sees past you. He sees past your past. He sees past the, what people see in you. He sees past the stuff that you see in yourself. The beauty of this father is that God is filled with compassion for lost people. And, he, and it says that actually in verse 20. It says he sees him. The second thing is he was filled with compassion for him. He was filled with compassion for him. And I just want you to point out, just like last week, that filled with compassion word is the same word in the Greek, splachnitsomai, moved with compassion. It's like a word that we just can't seem to get away from. Whenever we're talking about Jesus ministering to people who don't deserve it and hanging out with on-purpose sinners and people who are nothing like him, liking him, we see this word, splachnitsomai, it follows us around. We see it with Jesus every time he goes and heals people and feeds the 5,000 and, 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 and casts out a demon. It, more times than not, we see Jesus moved with compassion. Jesus, splechnitzomai, goes and does this thing. We saw it last week in the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan was moved with compassion to help his enemy. The father in this story was filled with compassion and he runs to his son. It's almost as if this word, splechnitzomai, moved with compassion, is directly tied to the Father's heart. And what I would say to each and every single one of us is that what would it look like if you allowed your heart, your splechnitzomai, for you to get moved with compassion, that the Holy Spirit would put something on your heart to cause you to do something that you wouldn't do on your own. And he doesn't just run to his son. This is why it's insane. It says in verse 20, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. When, when you choose to move toward God, God runs toward you. He runs toward you. And I absolutely love this picture 
of this messed up son, head held low, humiliated, ashamed, walking, reciting his three-point sermon of how he's going to get back into the house. And his dad <laughs> sees him and starts booking it. I, maybe he was looking to see if, the, if his dad had a shotgun with him. I don't know. You know what I mean? His dad's running. This big old man, what in the world is dad running at me for? And just hug tackles him and kisses him and just loves on this kid who smells and I just imagine this scene as he finally stands up like, Dad, what the heck? Getting like, whoa, I got some stuff to say. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. And he goes in verse 21, and this is what he says. The son said to him, Dad, okay, number one, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Number two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And number, he doesn't even get to number three. He's ready to say to his dad, Dad, if you could just, if you could just make me like one of your hired servants. His dad literally cuts him off in the middle of his third point. He doesn't even get to it. His dad cuts him off in the middle of it, and you see it in verse 22. The dad goes, quick! He's yelling at everybody. I mean, he's in a hurry about this. He's like, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. What? I was going to ask if maybe I could be like a, like a hired servant. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on this kid's feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And for the son of mine was dead and is alive and he was lost and now is found. And the Bible says that they began to celebrate. It's like this father could care less about this kid's plan. He's like, well, but dad, I got this. I I got this three thing. And dad's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I found you. You're home. You're here. I found you. But this kid, quick, hurry. He smells like shame. And he's like, get the best clothes. Get the best jewelry. Get the best shoes. Put them on him. Hurry, cover my son. Can I just remind you that God covers you with his grace? And it's not because you deserve it. And it's not because of all you've done. All all you did was turn towards him and start to walk towards, and he came running after you. Not to strike you down and to say, well, look what the cat dragged in. All these things that you've got to do in order to be able to come back and know that was your plan. His plan was to come and to quick, hurry, cover him with my grace. It would have been very easy just to expose his sin. It smelled all over me, smelled like it. The father says, no, quick, hurry, cover, cover my son with my grace. I mean, these are a great set of parables. The lost sheep, found, party. Lost coin, found, party. Lost son, found, party. Drop the mic. But then all of a sudden, Jesus takes a breath. And he continues. Verse 25, it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of his servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. This whole, like, meanwhile, back at the ranch thing, like, what in the world does this have to do with anything? It doesn't match any of the other three parables. You got the lost sheep, found, party, lost coin, found, party, lost kid, found, party. Wait. And then all of a sudden, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Because I think that it's, it's one thing for God to redefine the Father's heart, but I think what Jesus is also doing for probably maybe the Pharisees who are muttering is he's redefining lostness. What do I mean by that? I mean this. These, both of these brothers made very different choices in life, yet both of them were struggling with the same condition. They were both lost. They were both considered lost by the father. Now, you may be like, what do you mean, the older brother? Like, you said he was lost. 
He didn't leave home. He was a good kid. What are you, what are you talking about? Like, how was, how was he lost? He isn't rebelling. Well, I want you to remember this. All three of these stories have to do with these parables of things that are not where they should be. That's the point of all these parables, right? It's not that they're necessarily lost. They're just not where they should be. So you've got the, the lost sheep. It's not where it should be. It should be with the other 99. Let's go and bring it back. The lost coin, it's not where it should be. It should be with the other 10. Let's go and bring it back. The younger son, he's not where he should be. Let's go and bring him back. He should be home with his father. And the older son, he's not where he should be. He should be home inside, partying with his family. In verse 29, we see exactly why I'm saying that he's lost. Because look what the father does in verse, excuse me, verse 28. It says, so his father went out and pleaded with him. See, the father had to go out and to seek and to save the older brother just as much as he did with the younger. Because they were both lost. The older brother isn't lost because of his self-destruction, like, like his younger sibling. He's lost because of his own self-righteousness. He, he, he's not lost due to his badness. He's lost due to his own perceived goodness. I've done all the things. I've, I haven't left home. And I don't understand why you'd be throwing a party for this Yahoo. Went and spent all the money. Are you kidding me right now? Why in the world would we be celebrating something like that? See, I think what Jesus is actually communicating is this reality that religion can be just as deceiving as rebellion. And just as dangerous. I heard someone once say that sometimes what can separate you from God is not so much your rebellion, it's your damnable good works. <laughs> Why don't you just stew on that for a minute? Like both sons are lost because they're separated from the father. That's the definition of God the father heart of God. That's his definition of lost. It's not the fact that he was rebellious and what he did, and I can't believe you did that, and wow, you don't deserve that and all that. No, he looks at it as like, if you're apart from relationship with me, then you're lost. You, you, you're not where you should be. You should be home. You should be inside and partying with your dad. And we can tell this because in verse 29, I want you to see how the older son responds to his dad. He answered his father, look. You know when you start out a conversation with look, it's not going well, right? He doesn't even do the decency of, of like honoring his father by calling him father. I mean, the younger son did that. He's like, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. The, the, the older son, he's like, look, you because religion always puts God in the debt of you. Like he owes me something, right? It's almost like that's how he's coming. He's coming to his father like, look you, all these years I've been slaving for you. All of a sudden being a son in the house and having all of the amenities of that now becomes, well, I was been slaving for you. I've been slaving for you for all these years and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat. Or an old one for that matter. So I can celebrate with my friends. <laughs> like, literally, both sons, if we're going to be really honest, didn't really want to have closeness with their father. They wanted to use what the father had. One through rebellion and one through religion. They both wanted the benefits of being a son without the restrictions of having a father. And he goes on in verse 30. He's still complaining. But when this son of yours who has squandered your pro property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. You got to get higher and higher. It's, 
It's about as high as I can go. I'm not Mariah Carey. Like, I, like, <laughs> I want you to see what he's saying, though, without saying it. Essentially what he's saying, all of a sudden, he's claiming that his father now owes him for his goodness. That's religion. You owe me. Look, you. I've been coming to church. I've been doing what you told me to do. And I've not done the things that you told me not to do. You owe me. At least a young goat. He doesn't even ask for the fattened calf. Why? Because religion always settles for less, doesn't it? And he just, he, he, he's absolutely coming, coming unglued. He's saying, you owe me for my goodness. And I want you to see how the father responds. He says, my son, the father says, you're always with me and everything I have is yours why are you acting like I'm withholding something from you? But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. Let me tell you, Christian, if you want to know what Satan is after, this is it. Losing the joy of your salvation. Thinking that what you got for free you earned. being unwilling or unable to celebrate with other people's forgiveness <laughs> because of, it messes up the tally marks in yours. That we would get so busy doing the work of being a son instead of just forgetting to just the beauty of being a son. that we would fail to rejoice and to party with and to just be in the presence of, of the Father. That's what he's after. This is the redefinition of not only the Father's heart, but how we can be lost and still be home. Because <laughs> he wants to be connected to you. No matter where you are or who you are, identify with here in this story. Why don't you stand with me? So I looked up the word prodigal in the dictionary because I'm not as smart as many of you and I didn't know what it meant. It's not like you use that word often. When was the last time you were like, well, that's very prodigal of you, don't you think? <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt you've used it in the past week. If you have, I'd love to talk with you. <clears throat> I probably wouldn't understand most of our conversation, but I'd love to talk with you, right? Like most people don't use that word anymore. So I'm like, what does that even mean? And whenever I look up words, I like to guess before I see the definition of like what I think it probably means. So I don't think I'm that far off from may, what you might think too, because I was thinking, okay, like prodigal son, what's the definition of the word prodigal? It probably means like wasteful or rebellious like the rebellious son, or maybe like wayward. Wayward was probably my top one. I was like wayward, right? My wayward or rebellious son. But that's not what it means. I looked it up. I'm like, this is interesting. These are the definitions. Recklessly extravagant. Generous. Lavish. To which I was like, huh? like, hold up, <laughs> something ain't right here. Like, was the son excessive? Sure, yeah. I mean, he was like, spent it all on the craps table in Vegas. Yeah, it's excessive. Um, was his lifestyle and decision making excessive? Yeah, yeah, sure, certainly. But who is the most generous and lavish person in this story? Who's the most recklessly extravagant person in this story? The Father. By far the Father. His grace and His forgiveness and His unconditional love. He is the most prodigal person in this story. Honestly, I wonder for years, why, why in the world have we not called this the prodigal father? 
called the prodigal son. What in the world? This, this, this story is about the, the prodigal father because it isn't about the younger son. And it isn't about the, the, the older son. It's about the father, the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost. It isn't about the sheep. It isn't about the coin. It isn't about the younger son. It isn't about the older son. It is about this prodigal father. This God who was recklessly extravagant in his love, recklessly extravagant in his forgiveness, lavish in his compassion, over the top in his mercy. How prodigal he is in throwing a party for you. So no matter who you relate to in this story, maybe the religious or the rebellious, the older or the younger son, no matter where you find yourself and who you relate to, your heavenly father isn't mad at you and he isn't disappointed in you. It's this reality that humanity's greatest need is simply being found by our prodigal dad and to come home and to come inside. So for the rebels in here, you know who you are. I want to speak this over you. God loves you in spite of what you've done. And for the religious in here, I want to speak this over you. God loves you in spite of all you've done. (laughs) Everyone needs to hear that. That we come into the kingdom the same way. Every single one of us. We all have to check both our religion and our rebellion at the door and simply be found. by our prodigal father that is preposterous and outlandish and illogical and irrational this love that is not fair and I thank God it's not so are you ready to come home as we sing here today maybe I don't know where you're at right now maybe maybe you've been away and you just feel like man he doesn't see me I'm so far from home and and I and I because of what I've done I, I can't come back or maybe for some of you you're like you know what I've been coming to church I've been doing this thing but I've just been living out of duty I've been living out of just obligation doing the right things but not necessarily with the right heart and I just want to come home today to this God that is absolutely preposterous Maybe you just pray this prayer with me, just between you and him right now. Just make this your own, but it's just a, just a moment of just a, this is your homecoming. This is your homecoming today. Father God, I receive today this prodigal love that I know I don't deserve. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, of which are many. And I want to come home today. God, I thank you that you sent your one and only son to seek and to save me. Help me to walk out sonship not out of obligation, but out of passion. So Lord, I pray for each and every single person that made that, just that decision today. I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that there would be a change from the inside out, an identity setting moment, a resetting of our soul to come into alignment with our creator, our maker, our father, our prodigal dad that we're living not out of obligation or duty or religion, and we're turning away from our own rebellion and choosing to just come home and to be 
a child of the King. Lord, we thank you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Let's worship together, church.